I'm, uh, I'm Andrew Nix. I'm with Schneider Electric. Very excited to be here this morning to talk about cybersecurity. I'm actually joined by Constantine Antonio, part of our, our cybersecurity consulting team here in North America. Um, I, I manage our operational cybersecurity uh, solutions and services team for North and South America. Uh, we're a global organization. We have hundreds of members globally from deployment engineers to uh, solution architects, design engineers, uh, and consultants like ourselves to help answer the questions related to cybersecurity in the operational environments that, um, that we collectively in this room own and operate and, and manage and, and depend on. And so my goal here this morning is really not to dive straight into the weeds and get super protocol level technical with you. I know the coffee's still kicking in and all of that stuff, right? So we'll kind of lead into it and talk a little bit about where is cybersecurity from an operational standpoint? What are the things that we're most concerned about? What do we see across industry? Um, and give you some things to consider to take back to show where the risks are and then give you a little bit of takeaway from uh, things you can take back to your organization, some insights, some actions that you can start with this afternoon to really solve some of these problems. And this is from a series that we put together called Innovation Talks. Apparently TED Talks has already taken, somebody's doing that I hear. But uh, the, the purpose of this is not to be a lecture. Uh, it's not to just come up here and talk at you for um, you know, the next hour or so. Um, so please jump in, ask questions. There are no silly questions. Cybersecurity changes by the minute, right? So the, the landscape has changed when, you know, from when we got up this morning to now and, and questions are, you know, are, are valid. So please bring them up as you have them and we'll do our best to answer them for you. So right off the bat, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same playing ground. And I wanna talk about IT versus OT and why that <laughs> distinction is important. So when we think about cybersecurity, a lot of folks think about the traditional, you know, kind of office floor, our laptops, our printers, that sort of thing in a, in a carpeted space. And that's really what we call the IT cybersecurity realm. Those are, you know, your corporate uh, devices that, that sit in the offices that you've probably traveled here with today. Uh, some laptops that I've seen that are like IMAX theater screen size or massive that we carry around with us. Um, and the focus there is really on confidentiality. Uptime is important, but not as you know critical or life critical in the IT space necessarily. And then there's OT, operational cybersecurity, and that's really focused on the things that make um, businesses function, that make operations happen, power, buildings, um, controls. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. It's a space that has traditionally been a little underserved from the cybersecurity realm. We're catching up now. Um, but in that area, we're talking about things that impact production um, of, of you know, whatever products we're making, be it uh, power, water, a uh, physical good or service. And the availability of those devices is extremely important and could have life safety implications. And that's why OT cybersecurity is such an important topic today and has grown over the last you know, decade as we started to connect devices, bring them online. Now they have IP addresses, they're all talking to each other. Some are new, some are old, there's different manufacturers and vendors. So cybersecurity becomes really important. And just as we've seen that grow, the attack landscape has kept up with it. It's an opportunity for attackers to move from the traditional, um, you know, IT space where they're going after credit card information and things like that into operational spaces where they can have more of an impact, and we'll talk about that in a second. And as that industry grows, we see responses from adversaries. New types of malware become more advanced, uh, more you know, higher in quantity, they're targeting specific types of devices. And from you know, over the last 10 years, you can see starting with just one uh, you know, form of cybersecurity um, uh, malware that was really you know, kind of government built into individual you know, tools that come out of different entities, they're building them on their own. It's a, it's a vast landscape that's continuing to evolve and grow because there's a lot of revenue for, for attackers in this space. And when we look at the statistics that come out of this, there's, there's a lot of interesting type of stuff and we see the, the change over the years. The thing that I think is most interesting to me is that the average ransom fee, when we see ransomware, which we'll talk about more, has gone up from $5,000 in 2018 to over $200,000 um, in 2021. And that can be per device, per, per subnet, 
per facility. It really depends on how they implement it and how they want to get paid. And the largest ransomware payout that we saw in 2021 was about $40 million. And that's just the payout. That's not investigation. That's not you know fixes and repairs and replacing equipment. It's just the payment. So it's becoming a big thing. And what I find really interesting as well is some of the statistics on the right. So obviously we expect a lot of respondents in this, in this survey um, that was conducted by CISA, Cyprus, and ABC found that you know, they had revenue loss from this attack. It was, you know, production was down, um, things of that nature. Um, they had brand reputation, things that you would expect. But we also saw companies having to reduce their workforce. They have less availability of funds. Um, they, they found that their insurance coverage did not actually cover everything that they thought. And this is very, very common. We've seen a lot of organizations that buy cybersecurity insurance or have believe they have it. And then when it comes time for uh, them to use it, the coverage is limited or they didn't have the right controls in place. So the carrier says, well, I'm sorry, but I can't cover this. Um, I mean, think of it like having a hole in your roof and then you know filing a claim for water damage, right? They're gonna say, yeah, you have a hole in your roof, you weren't protecting yourself, I can't give you, you know, the full coverage for this. The same is true of cybersecurity. And then over the last couple of years with COVID, we saw a 600% increase in the amount of malware sent via email. Folks are stressed, they're working from home, they're working from Starbucks, they're working from the beach, who knows? They're all connecting in and trying to get work done quickly and efficiently, but that can lead to some, um, you know, some skips, some misses in what would normally be um, something that might be easy to catch. And they're getting more clever in how they embed malware. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. So we also looked at a, a Gardner research survey from 2021, and they interviewed different organizations and used some of the outputs to rank folks and figure out where do organizations stand in their level of maturity. It's kind of like that that uh, that that old um, you know saying that 90% of people believe they are you know the best driver on the road. Well, when you ask folks about their cybersecurity. Yeah, they, they feel like they're the best. But then when you rank them and actually understand what they have, what they're doing, the reality is a little bit more polarizing. We saw a lot of folks from an operational standpoint, remember, are really early in this journey. They're at the point where they know they need to do something. Maybe they have a couple tools in place. They haven't maybe taken the time to see if, it's, if they're interacting properly, if they're actually working, um, uh, working together. 60% uh, of organizations are there or before, so it's an early stage. 30% of organizations are in a step where they're just starting to get visibility to what they have, all the assets in the environment. What, what's actually there? Do I know everything that's connected? Or am I just looking at maps from you know, 10 years ago when the system was commissioned? Right? Um, and then you know, moving on to those oh wow moments, the firefighting, you know, solving those types of problems. 30% of organizations are at the point where they're just now starting to do that in the operational space. They already be done in IT. These are all companies that have IT groups. They have IT organizations and tools. They're not necessarily extended into the operational side of the environments where we pick up all of the data that goes into tools like Aviva, that goes into our, our management systems, our platforms. And only 10% of organizations are at a point where it's all integrated together, it's working cohesively, it's working together, and it's well organized and balanced. So that leaves us with 90% of organizations that are still on that journey. So if you're there, you're not alone. You're working with a lot of folks. Um, and so the message here being that as long as you're progressing down that pathway, there's help to make sure that you get to the point where you're effective and where you're secure. So the other cool thing that I, I found um, from a, a, a ProfitWell survey in 2021 is that those folks that are along that journey have started to really recognize that the bare minimum isn't really enough. And we'll go into this a little bit more later with security levels and what those are. It's a standard, it's a defined thing that you can point to and say, I need to be at this level and here's what I need to do to get there. But across different industries, and you can maybe take a, a moment to find yours, you can see where, um, where folks feel like they need to be. A lot of folks believe they need to be at the highest level or one step back from it, which is probably about right. 
Um, but very few industries are at a point where um, most of the industry still believes they don't need anything. So it's a very good progress in the right direction for OT cybersecurity. Now it becomes a measure of making sure that you're aligned with your peers so that you have a defendable landscape as with them and you're not the, you know, the, the, the lowest hanging fruit for the tanker. The reason this is so important is the timeline of an actual attack can be a lot different than people think. And so I wanted to kind of walk through what that looks like. And this is a realistic example um, of an attack on an HVAC system. This could be in a commercial building, could be in a data center, could be in any number of different places. But this system, on day one, um, we had somebody come in. Remember we said earlier, 600% increase in, uh, in, in uh, malware transmitted by email. Somebody comes in and clicks an email. Maybe it's a uh, really convincing looking um, FedEx delivery email or something like that, right? We've seen that a thousand times. Um, and once they click that, they're prompted to log in, they're prompted to download something. Of course, they, they do that because they're working quickly trying to figure out what's this coming to my house? What's going on with this? What's this thing that my boss wanted me to do? I didn't see it wasn't actually his email. Um, and then they start to notice things are functioning a little bit weird. Ask their, ask their coworkers about it. Coworkers didn't necessarily get that email. Why did I get it? This is kind of weird. Um, so they go ahead and try to back up the system to make sure that they're covered, there's not gonna be any problems. But then shortly after that, the file that they've downloaded is ransomware executable. So that starts locking up systems, starting with theirs. It spreads on its own because that's how they're programmed to do it. Um, and the front end of that is, the front end of their system, their, you know, their visuals are locked up. So then they start to contact the vendor. This is maybe a bit optimistic. The vendor arrives with a new PC the same day and then um, you know, pulls their backup into that machine, they're ready to go, um, and they can have their system back up and function. Staff leaves for the day, everybody goes home, everything's normal, no problems, right? Crisis averted. <coughs> Typically though, what we actually see is that when things start to traverse, they get beyond the spots where people are immediately looking and they wait for more damage to be done. So in reality, staff arrives on day two, we notice that building is a little bit warmer than usual. And after a while, um, they start to notice some of the controllers in those environments are, are bricked or smurfed or whatever term you want to use, blue screen, not really a controller term on Windows, but you catch my drift. Then they discover that some of the, the variable frequency drives that are running the motors in that HVAC system uh, are not functioning. Uh, they notice that the pumps that have been running are cavitating. They notice that the um, you know, because of all this, they have to reinspect a lot of their equipment and make sure that it's functioning properly and they have to replace things. And then at the end of day two, um, they're still trying to make sure that there's no more spread because again, they, they missed this at the end of day one. So they're starting to do backups on other machines, doing more and more, um, you know, work to try to reinstall fresh applications, get those visuals back up and running, make sure that everything is working as it was the, way, the day before. Then on day three, they start, you know, uh, reprogramming, uh, or they keep reprogramming things, installing the original programs. They have to reorder equipment that's damaged, those cavitated pumps, those damaged VFDs. They have to throw more, uh, you know, throw more devices out in the field and correct all of that. They're replacing equipment over the next couple of weeks, and this is assuming that there's no, you know, shortages of that equipment. It takes longer time for it to get there, and you're having to do work events. Um, then finally, once that's uh, once that arrives. You can start reprogramming controllers, redoing updates, then putting in cyber controls to uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen again, then reinspecting, and then recommissioning that equipment to keep on to keep on going. So something that you know people may have assumed is just a quick fix. I get ransomware, I, I reinstall the image, I move along with my day, can literally take months to resolve. And this is not uncommon. We see this quite a bit. So cybersecurity is becoming a more longer term problem when it hits. So we take a lot more time to invest in proactive approaches to prevent that from happening than necessarily just reactive after things are in, in play. So why are these so successful? Why is this becoming an industry of its own? Well, the cool thing is there's things that we can do about it. 
but for the attackers, there's a lot of information out there that's really valuable that they're after, right? So a lot of IP that's invested in technologies and processes and, and the products that you're making, um, and that loss, the, the loss of that, they know it's going to cause you pain. They know there's value for them to um, give that back to you. Um, that equipment, just like we saw in the last example, tampering with it, damaging it, can have long-term effects, have long lead times for it to be replaced. It's a lot of downtime potentially. Or again, they can cause you pain that they're looking for either politically or to get financial gain from it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, more regulation, more public scrutiny. Uh, this is becoming a, you know, a, a more publicized thing. We see more cybersecurity you know, attack details in the news because it, it makes headlines, it's, it's popular. Um, and regulations come into play then. I always say every rule has somebody's name on it, right? What caused that to be put into place? Nobody wants that to be that. And then mixed vendor, mixed maturity infrastructure. Nobody's plant is a single vendor, not even ours. So across the entire environment that you have, there's different protocols being used. There's different ages of equipment, some new, some old, some in between. There's different software, there's different you know, brand of equipment, all sorts of different things. All of this creates a little bit of risk uh, and complexity in being able to get things back up and running if there is something that hits you. So one of the things that I really wanna focus on for a bit today is the topic of ransomware. Because we talk about where cybersecurity is, this is at the forefront. We're seeing a lot more ransomware attacks. We saw that statistic um, on the first slide where it happens every really few seconds, almost 14 seconds. Um, and these are very effective tools. They, um, they cause a lot of problems, and especially in the OT space, there's no guarantee that if a you know, program from a controller is encrypted with one of these tools that you'll actually get it back even if you pay a ransom not necessarily the best at unencrypting OT platforms and protocols. So ransomware itself is really just a, it's a bug. Um, and it, it, it operates like you know, viruses do in humans. It spreads in, in wherever it can, tries to make contacts and links and jump from one to the next and cause you know, lockdowns in this case uh, and cause issues. They, they try to lock out users from accessing files, from accessing databases, uh, they spread in most cases automatically. Um, they're designed to do that. And they require a decryptor. And usually you're supposed to pay for that decryptor, usually via something like Bitcoin or some sort of crypto because they are very hard to trace. Attackers know that. Um, so that's ransomware as, as itself. This is a, an example of that. Um, <clears throat> typically there's a timeline. They put a little pressure on you. You have to pay a certain amount by this time or the you know, ransom itself increases, or they just lock you out and you have no other options, the files are gone. So <clears throat> now there's an emergence of ransomware as a service. Again, it's an industry. And you can actually track it and see where they take off for holidays, they kind of stagger the weekends, there's service plans around ransomware. Um, you can actually pay for a 1-800 number that you call in, They'll help you execute your ransomware attack. They'll guarantee you a certain amount of return. Um, it, is, it is becoming pretty advanced. They have support models of their own, their own version of uh, you know, support agreements. And they're being built now to where non-technical folks just with an agenda can execute them. So that's why this is becoming such an interesting thing in the operational space. We have so many assets. We have a lot of IoT that's going into place, sens uh, sensors and meters and things of that nature at risk for ransomware attacks. How do we make sure that we're protected? And the reason that it's so effective is because, again, OT is high value. It's you know, very little tolerance for downtime, especially in the utility space or in critical manufacturing. Um, you know, data centers, things like that, really can't afford for those to go down. And if they can cause you pain, they can translate that into money. It's money for them. They, they know that you're going to pay to have that pain taken away. It's really low risk for them. They, uh, you know, attackers, you know, especially if they're using crypto payments, can basically just hide behind it. There's no reason for them to identify themselves unless they're doing that attack as a marketing campaign to try to get more service from folks coming to them to use them to do more attacks than other people. 
like I said, these tools are getting more advanced. They don't require a lot of technical knowledge to deploy. Anybody can do it. Um, and there's a shortage of qualified employees. We, we all feel that, right? especially in cybersecurity and especially in OT cybersecurity. Knowledge of how to defend all those systems, all those specific operational tools is really limited. And so keeping up with that um, can be a challenge and that makes it even more advantageous for attackers. Attackers don't care if you're short staffed that day, if, you're, you know, if your IT lead is on holiday, whatever it may be. In fact, they, they hope that that's the case because it will cause chaos and that's what they're looking for. So how does this happen? Well, there's four major ways that we see ransomware getting into networks these days. The first is credential scraping. And I'll show you an example of each of these. Credential scraping is using any sort of you know, method to get someone's information so that they can have legitimate access into your network. It could be one of those um, you know, phishing exercises where they try to get you to log in, they'll fake a website that looks like you're logging into your own environment. Then they have your username and password. It's perfect because no one will know that it's not you unless you have something in place to tag an IP address, your history tracking, that sort of thing. Uh, there's phishing messages to malicious emails like we've talked about. Infected websites where there's, um, you know, a, a line of malware within the code of the website, within the source. Um, unless you're checking all of those yourself, which I'm, I certainly don't. If you can inadvertently download something um, and, <clears throat> and infect your system without even knowing. And then the sale of information. Uh, there's whole forums that specialize in gathering leaked credentials and login details and uh, zero day attacks that you can use across different organizations. I'll show you some examples of that. But let's start with credential scraping. Now, I know we've been talking on a lot of gloom and doom for the last few minutes, so I'm gonna show you a clip from Kimmel that, uh, that might help make this one a little bit more reality of how easy this can be for credential scraping. A lot about cybersecurity lately, largely because of what happened to Sony. Companies and individuals are more concerned about the safety and privacy of their information than ever. President Obama has unveiled a number of new proposals this week to crack down on hackers, and he plans to address this in the State of the Union speech on Tuesday. And it's great that the government is working on this, but the truth of the matter is, we need to do a better job of protecting ourselves. You know, the most popular password in the United States is password one two three, and as long as we're as long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password, and <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, six, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah, four, six, eight, and then Israel. It's it's only three, but it's you know it's uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, like so what? like... Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. Um, what's your grandma's um, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, a, it's a funny skit, but it, it it's really can be that easy just to grab that type of information off of folks <coughs> and learn <coughs> what their login is. 
and that's credential scraping in a nutshell. And it happens to folks a lot of times without them even knowing. And then the second way is phishing messages. And I can imagine there's no one in this room that hasn't gotten one of these recently, right? These are two from, from me specifically. Um, an Amazon one where, again, if I'm not paying attention, I might just call that number and give this code, which of course they would never ask for, um, to try to understand why I, someone reset my password. And then they'll either try to sell me a cybersecurity tool that doesn't exist and just steal my bank account information or, or you know, what have you, get my Amazon credentials, and then they can order things for themselves. Um, and then I got one for my cell phone. Uh, this was sent to me. Um, I don't have AT&T. And I got an AT&T message saying um, that you know my phone bill was was uh, was high last month or what have you. It came from an area code 917, which I think was you know, somewhere in the in the northeast. Why would that come from that phone number? <clears throat> but you click that link, you're given a page that looks similar to the AT&T page with just a couple mistakes to see if you're paying attention. Ideally, you log in, and then they have your login information. They can get credit card information from that. They can open new lines, order devices. It's that simple. The same is true with operational networks. As soon as they can get in, they can start changing values. They can, you know, get from one device to the next to the next. Um, they can grow from there. And the third one is infected websites, and this one is a little bit harder. But in the operational space, that's why a lot of folks completely limit any device that's in that space from connecting to the internet, so that you can't interact with. And this was a, a particular uh, web page. And if you went into the actual source of that page, you could identify within that two lines of Java code uh, or scripting that had an applet that would download and then execute on your device. Um, something that, again, you would probably not notice just happening normally. You load in the background, you think, oh, there's a lot of ads. It's probably taking a long time to load. And this is happening. The last one is sale mm -hmm. of information. This one is particularly interesting as well, because again, there's whole organizations that focus on getting details to sell to people to get into different environments. And these are three real examples. Uh, the top one is uh, from a, a, uh, a dark web forum, or this individual is pretty well known, um, had credentials to log into a petroleum facility in the country of Georgia, uh, and then a nuclear facility in Romania. Now, there's only one, in Romania, so we have a good idea of what that is. But what's interesting is look at the price. $8,000 for that credential, and he'll sell it to as many people want to buy it. $3,000 for the nuclear facility. Now, we suspect, or I suspect, the reason that that's lower is because the nuclear facility has more cybersecurity regulation. They're up to NERC SIP standards. So it's assumed that they can do less damage in that environment, if, even if they have logins, and so it's not as valuable. So once you have more cyber controls in place, even if your information gets out, it's not as useful. On the bottom right, we have a uh, data leak for um, a Brazilian energy company, Enel, uh, and this was a, a real screenshot from, uh, from the forum selling that information. Um, details for a service range of about 20 million Brazilians. So you can imagine the damage that can be caused if they're able to bring down substations, cause issues to the grid, impact the frequency of power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the last one here, which is very small by intention. I don't want anybody reading all of this, um, but this is um, a, um, a screenshot of a database of default username and passwords of different devices that's available generally for sale on the dark web. Um, that's why it's so important to make sure that nothing's using admin admin. Right. So how often is this happening? Well, it's constant. It's 365 days a year. It's every moment of every day because this can happen from anywhere. This is a recording of what's called the Norse attack map. Now it's a little bit marketing, a little bit um, you know, reality, but this kind of shows what you, everyone collectively in this room is up against. Attacks from all different places, some in our home ground. Um, everybody's looking for you know, a, a way to cause an impact to get their, their revenue um, and do it in a way that's, that's easiest for them. So to that point, a lot of companies think that their access, VPNs, their networks as a whole um, are like this, multiple layers, very secure, uh, just like we talked about earlier. Right? 
and bonus points to anyone who can tell me where that is. Come back to that. But in reality, it's kind of more like this. <laughs> so <clears throat> cybersecurity becomes more and more important as these attacks get more advanced, as there's more ways to do it, as there's more ways to cause damage, and as we digitize more things and bring them onto the network. It's a good thing. We should be doing that. We need that data to be more advanced, more efficient, but we, we need to do it in a way that's secure. So we've talked about where cybersecurity is. Um, the last thing I want to cover before we get into some answers is the concept of, eh, but I'm, I'm not important. I'm, nobody's going to attack me. I'm just so-and-so. And that actually makes you the perfect target because if organizations feel like you're not prepared, if they feel like you, um, you, you, know, you don't think you're a target, then they're going to go after you more because they want you to be unprepared. They, attacks happen a lot of times during shift changes, holidays, when they can identify that there's fewer people logged in or that there's you know, login exchanges happening, where they can get in and cause issues without people noticing immediately. And attackers aren't focusing on necessarily you, your facility your organization. They're focusing on the wider scale. They're looking for any open spot they can find. Uh, there's whole tools that just search for PLCs that are pinging the internet because that's a great way into an OT network. So um, there's a lot happening that makes you an, uh, a target, even if you don't think you are, even if you say that you're air gapped, um, that's not really the answer anymore. Now, the cool thing is, with all this out there, there are ways to defend yourself um, and your organization that are basically built by all of us, right? And those are the standards like IEC 62443. It's an industrial framework that, um, you know, has been built by industry, built by the leaders in cybersecurity, not just vendors, but also operators and government organizations um, that are you know, charged with defining the right way to make sure that everyone is up to the same level of cybersecurity, we're all defendable um, and securable. And they have different levels within that, one through four, of defense uh, types, what you're defending against. Generally, security level one is just casual, accidental things. Somebody comes in and, uh, you know, messes with a computer that they shouldn't have access to, didn't realize they were causing a problem. Accidental, that's level one. That's really the minimum that you should have in place to open the doors and operate in a level of security. Security level two then bumps it up just a little bit and that's um, intentional attacks, but low means of, of resources. Um, this is kind of what we would call maybe like a script kitty if you're familiar with the term, someone who just grabs a tool and runs it and sees what they can do. Then you get into level three. And that's a little bit more sophisticated. Now you've got an attacker who's not necessarily going after you specifically, but they have more resources, they have more sophisticated tools, they have more skills to do things once they're in a network. These may be, you know, former, um, you know, uh, former experts in, in a certain OT protocol or, or uh, device. And then level four, the highest level, uh, which is protection against a nation state. Now that's more difficult. Um, so we typically say that organizations should least aim for security level three. In some cases, aim for four, but achieve three. But the good thing is, all of this is laid out and the, uh, the standards actually tell you what you need to do to get to any one of those three levels. And we'll talk about that in just a second and how you can identify which one you need. So how do you defend yourself against all the things that we've been talking about? Well, the first thing is to do regular cybersecurity assessments. And Constantine's gonna talk about that a little bit more here in a bit, um, but that's critically, critically important. You can't defend what you don't know. And so having somebody with an outside view who's seen other players in the industry, who's seen other industries as a whole, can give you a lot of insight into where you really are on that scale of zero to 100% and what you need to do to get to the right place for you and what you do as an organization. Uh, the, the next step is to segment your OT network. Uh, this is super critical. It's the same thing as, as we've been kind of doing as a, as, a, as a society over the last few years. Right? 
put us, you know, kind of segment the the network so that you know if we're um, if we're in a position where there is an, an infection, a, a malware that gets out, we're preventing spread from other, to other places. We're trying to make it as isolated as possible to limit the impact on an overall organization. So if something happens over here, we have a way to isolate it and keep production going while we fix it. Um, most important thing there as well is making sure that just like we talked about, all those super important devices, whatever you identify as your crown jewels, should not touch the open internet. You shouldn't be able to access it. Unidirectional communication up is okay. There's ways to do that in, in many cases, um, but critical devices should not be on the open internet. We've actually seen cases where we do scans of an organization and find somebody's got an Xbox sitting on their control network in the, in the operations room. Uh, and, and they're you know playing Forza or whatever while they're while they're working. No, <laughs> should not happen. Um, the next thing is backups, automatic backups, securing those backups, making sure that they're going to multiple places. Uh, we've seen a lot, you know, especially with our experience in oil and gas and over by the Gulf, where the organizations that have backups that say locally to a facility that, by the way, just got hit by a hurricane. So now your backup sitting in that and that uh, storage facility that's underwater. It doesn't really help you. Um, so multiple multiple backups, testing them, validating, make sure that they actually work. It's really important. Um, and then again, organizing into zones, which goes along with our, our segmentation. Um, anything that's super critical, like I keep saying the crown jewels, things that are super important to your operations, things that y'all have developed on your own, uh, not off the shelf, things like that. Uh, make sure that those are stored um, source codes, critical configurations, um, copied and stored elsewhere so that you always have those um, just in case. And the other thing here is practice, practice, practice. We all know if, if we're still going into offices, a fire drill, where do we go? Where's the muster point? Who's our fire uh, you know, safety champion? But not everybody knows what to do in the case of a cyber attack. And that's the chaos that folks are looking for. Right? They want you to be confused. They want you to not know who to turn to. And we've done a lot of exercises where we get everybody in a room and say, all right, this critical switch, core switch goes down. You lose visibility to this whole facility, or this whole control network. Who owns it? What's step one? How do you validate? And the finger point back and forth, and somebody is like, I, what do you want me to do? I don't know what to do with that. I thought it was him. And so <laughs> practicing that and knowing where to go is super, super important. And that goes along with training as well so that everybody knows their role. And the last thing here is have at least one tool from each of the, the uh, NIST cybersecurity pillars and keep them up to date. And these are those pillars. It's identified. What's, what do you have? What's out there? A tool that helps you with um, you know, inventory of your assets, and we, we can show that at our, our booth later. Um, testing and validation, assessments. Permit, what are the things that need to be, um, that, that need to happen and don't need to happen, and how do we make sure that they're following those rules? Multi-factor authentication. Secure remote access for OT, which does not include using Microsoft Teams to connect to that controller. Don't do it. <laughs> Uh, protect, which is, you know, um, host intrusion prevention systems, HIPS, patch management, uh, controlling the ability to plug things into, uh, into devices, the USBs, charging your phones on that, on that server, gives that server a connection to LTE that it did not have before, it's a potential risk. <coughs> Detect, now we're getting real advanced, including anomaly detection, we're using sort of, I know it's a buzzword lately, but sort of artificial intelligence in our environments to understand how that facility runs and when something happens in it, that's out of the ordinary. Because that can be the earliest indicator that something's happening. And then respond. Backup and recovery, forensics, incident response. Have a plan, know where to go, whether you're doing it yourselves or you contract somebody else, make sure that you have something in place. So having something from each of these pillars is critical to making sure that you're advancing along that list that we showed earlier. So you remember the security levels uh, from a minute ago, and I said each of these has kind of a base <coughs> that have been built for what technologies you need, depending on which level that you want to adhere to. Here it is. So 
we put this together to help show the types of things that need to be in place to meet those different levels. I know this is probably a little small in the back. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get you a copy of it. You don't have to type it all out or, 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 uh, or screenshot it right now. Um, but this is a um, this is the case of what needs to happen to reach each of those levels. The first one's real basic. You'll notice an assessment as part of each one because again, you can't defend what you don't know. Use the time to make sure that you have visibility to, to start wrapping up. Let's say that you leave here, you go back to your hotel room, you're sending an email to your boss saying how important cybersecurity is, I need to get started right now, here are some things that we can take away, are we doing these right now? And in the process of that, you get so excited, you click on an email that is ransomware. And that starts infecting your device. What do you do? Well, the first thing is to stay calm because it's important that you're not you know, that the organization as well as you and individuals in it doesn't panic. Again, that's what they're looking for. Isolate that device right away. Find a way to disconnect it, stop the spread. Uh, assess the damages. Where do we see things happening? What's going on? Spend the time to do that properly so we don't get in the situation that we saw earlier where we think it's addressed and yet here we are, day 92, finally resolving that issue. Locate patient zero. Where did it start? Now, again, if you don't have tools in place to monitor cybersecurity and do that uh, analysis of your behavior of that, of that uh, facility, that can be a little tough. And that's where those tools come into play to tell you, hey, I noticed this happened at this millisecond. That's where it started. And give you that root cause that you need to act quickly. Um, and then start you know, deciding, do I need to report this incident to the authorities? Um, get backups in place, learn and evaluate the decryption options. How do you get this information back? Is it, is your, are your backups covering it? Do you need to uh, decrypt? Can you reload? What, you know, what needs to happen there? And then learn and move forward. There's a lot of organizations that this happens to. Um, my, my own family members and their small businesses have had ransomware happen to them. Um, it's a learning lesson, uh, but um, you know, if you have the right tools in place, you can help prevent that, you can help limit the damage, and you become an unattractive target to these, to these attackers. Because if they see you as you know, well defended, well versed in cybersecurity, just like that example with the, the credentials from the nuclear facility, you're less valuable to them. They're going to go after the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest way to get their, their revenue. And if you're difficult, they don't want to deal with you. And the last thing I'll say on this is we get the question a lot of, well, if I get hit, do I, shouldn't I just pay it and move on? Like that'll make the, the issues go away right away, right? Not necessarily. One being like we talked about earlier, especially in the OT area, that doesn't necessarily give you, you know, 100% back your operations. There may be things that are encrypted in a way that are difficult to get back up and running. It may have bricked some devices. Um, so you may pay a ransom and then still have an extraordinary effort to get things back up and running. And the other thing is, these folks communicate, they talk. And so if you pay that ransom, they know that you're gonna pay. You're a customer, like it or not. And so then they start to look at you as a repeat target. What's the next thing? If they paid this much, can I get 60% as much out of them next time? What do I do? What do I go with? And so there's a lot that um, that needs to be considered when, you, when going into that. Um, and there's you know, plenty of organizations like DHS, um, as well as incident response organizations and teams that can help you decide what the right thing is.